couple more people in the waiting room. Uh, just to give you guys a preview, uh, please check out our podcast. Uh, if you haven't, we have released some new episodes uh, that will be very interesting to you. And if you're not a member of uh, HAE Connect, uh, please sign up. Uh, we couldn't add our second guest today. We have two two special guests. Ouch. Uh, yeah, sorry, Ooh, sorry, Connor. Rough. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a long approval process to get the photos here. <laughs> so we have two special guests today. Uh, our first presenter, uh, Naomi uh, Bagdonis, is a lecturer at Stanford's GSB and an executive coach. She helps leaders be more innovative, flexible, and resilient in the face of change by facilitating interactive sessions for Fortune 100 companies and nonprofits and coaching executives and celebrities for appearances ranging from Saturday Night Live to the Today Show. Connor uh, is co-founder and co-CEO of Merit America, a nonprofit preparing low-wage workers for skilled careers at scale and a lecturer at Stanford GSB. Uh, Naomi and, and Connor are joining us today to share findings from behavioral science, advice from world-class comedians and stories from inspiring leaders to reveal how humor works and how you can use it to be more effective at work and more joyful in life. Thank you so much, uh, Connor and Naomi for, for being here with us today. And uh, we have a few more participants in the waiting room just to let them in. And I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having us, um, Joe and Regina and the whole team. It's been a real delight. And a special thank you to John, Brian and Sally for having their video on. We would love to encourage Ooh. others uh, to take uh, put your video on if you feel so comfortable. We're going to have something that's a little bit interactive. Yes, Kathy. Yeah, Kathy. Love yes, it. and look at those headphones. Kathy Love wins the for headphones. Most impressive headwear so yes, far. Yes, Lynn. Lynn. Yes, Lynn. Um, Hello, there will Lynn. Be, there will be prizes for those who come uh, <laughs> and share their, their faces. <laughs> Uh, we actually will give prizes, so that's incentive. All right, so we are really excited to be here. Thank you for having us. Um, as Joe mentioned, Connor and I teach together along with our partner in crime, Dr. Jennifer Ocker at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. We teach courses about the power of humor in business. And as Kathy mentioned via my very expensive plug, we also just released a book on the topic, Humor Seriously, which was an instant national bestseller. And I highly recommend that you buy it right now. I am totally unbiased on the topic. Um, Connor and I also teach executive teams about how to have more humor, in particular in remote settings. If that feels remotely relevant to you, then you might wanna think about becoming remotely humorous. Now, I should mention, we're of course at Stanford today. This is, you can tell that this is real, right? Under the beautiful Stanford sunshine, 65 degrees. Uh, and our course at Stanford about the power of humor gets the same academic credit as financial accounting. Now, you could say that this is a problem that Stanford has, or you could say maybe there's something here that is actually pretty powerful. Um, because through this work, we know three things. And can everyone see my screen all right? Perfect. Yeah. All right, so through this work, we know three things. Number one, humor has a transformative effect on our behavior and psychology, on our mental health, on our creativity, our feelings of closeness with others, and even our sense of meaning in life. Number two, it is a completely under-leveraged asset at work. Our workplaces are far too humorless. And number three, humor is a learnable skill. We know that small shifts in behavior and mindset are really all it takes to reap the benefits, which are particularly profound in hard times. By the way, this slide illustrates one of the most important principles of humor, which is you've got to pay attention. Now, if anyone didn't notice, we have a third guest on the slide right here. We're gonna to have to stay alert here, people. All right, thank you, Sally. All right, so here's the big problem, and that is that we have all fallen off a humor cliff. And Connor has fallen into mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Papa, can you hear me? <laughs> okay, sorry. The problem is that we have fallen off a humor cliff. So as this graph so beautifully illustrates. Um, there, was a, there was a global study of 1.4 million people that found that around, around the age of 23, we fall off a cliff. We stop laughing. The number of times that we laugh during the day plummets, which is devastating. So just to spice this up a little bit, um, we want to make this a little more palatable because it's actually <laughs> a really sad 
recognition, uh, a really sad realization. Um, so there we go. We've fallen off the humor cliff. Uh, we have seen that the average four-year-old laughs up to 300 times per day, whereas the average 40-year-old laughs that many times in two and a half months. Now, of course, these aren't average times and the pandemic, unbelievable political and social strife, global warming, global storming, the shock, uh, shocking breakup of Dale and Claire from The Bachelor. I mean, who would have guessed despite her giving up everything to be there? I mean, <laughs> Uh, it's no wonder that we're not laughing. And there's another reason too. And that is that the more technology mediated our communication becomes, the easier it is to lose our sense of humor and our humanity along the way, because we're all communicating through robots. And when we talk through screens all day, it's really easy to start sounding like a robot too. But all the while, humor is a superpower. And as I mentioned, it's one that is vastly under leveraged in business today. So let's talk about the power of humor briefly. Uh, research into our neurochemistry and behavior shows that humor increases our power and influence. So it makes others perceive us as higher in status, more confident, more competent, which of course we need to be able to make real change. It builds bonds and diffuses tension. And we know that the health of our relationships are one of the greatest predictors of well being, especially during hard times. We know that humor unlocks more creative thinking, which of course we need now more than ever in a fast changing world. And we know that humor bolsters resilience. It fends off depression and anxiety, and it even makes people report feeling higher levels of, um, of agency in their lives. People report having more control when they report having a sense of humor. So in essence, humor, like really nothing else, sways opinions, it sways heads and it sways hearts. So I wanna share a brief story here. Um, Back in the quaint days of yore, 1984, Ronald Reagan was running for re-election. Oh my goodness, weren't those simpler those times? Those were the good everyone? old days. Simpler times in the quaint days of yore. He was running for election and he was the oldest candidate to be running for president at the time. 74 years old. Can you imagine a 74 year old president? No, no one could so have So old. So old, no one could imagine it. And there were some concerns about his ability, especially mentally to keep doing what he was doing. And in particular, in the first debate against, uh, against Mondale, there were a couple of moments where Reagan felt uh, lost for words. He seemed to go blank. And this was Walter Mondale, looking back, said that this was the single moment that he believed he could really win this election. And so Reagan, at this point, had one more debate left against Mondale. And he knew that the most important challenge he had was to reassure the country that what they saw in that first debate was an aberration, that he will be fine as president for a second term. So he shows up for the second debate. And, uh, and he obviously knows that this question or this topic is going to be coming. And so his people around him are all trying to coach him. They're saying, you know, like, well, you know, what if you say this? Or what if you, what if you cite this data? Or what if you cite your track record here? And he tells them, no, 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 I got it. I've got this. So he goes into the debate. Uh, his team doesn't know what he's going to say. And when the question comes up, the moderator asks this. You already are the oldest president in history. Can everyone Some hear of okay? Your staff say you were fantastic. Tired after your most recent encounter with Mr. Mondale. I recall yet that President Kennedy had to go for days on end with very little sleep during the Cuba Missile Crisis. Is there any doubt in your mind that you would be able to function in such circumstances? Not at all. Mr. Truitt and I, and I want you to know that also, I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> All right, so this was a great moment. It's a great line. The crowd laughs, the moderator's laughing. And this beautiful moment too, where you catch Mondale in the screen even laughing, right? He gets it right away. And Mondale later said that he knew that this, at that moment, he knew, okay, this thing is over. He's addressed it and this election is over. And a few weeks later, Reagan won in a 48 state landslide. So, all right, so let's talk about what is going on here, because obviously humor is fun. It makes us feel good. 
But especially for leaders, it's really important to know what is happening for us psychologically, what's happening for our employees and their perceptions. So we know that individuals with a sense of humor are attributed 38% higher status. They're seen as more competent, more confident. And in research studies, these individuals are more likely to be voted into leadership roles. Uh, roles. Particularly powerful for leaders because leaders who are seen as having a sense of humor. This is not my leader is funny. This is that they have a sense of humor are seen as 27% more motivating and admired. Their employees are 15% more engaged. And when their teams take on a creativity challenge and laugh before taking it on, they're more than twice as likely to solve that challenge. So why is this? Cognitively, what is going on? What's going on is that humor changes our brains. So this creepy slide is exactly what's going on in your brain when you laugh. Now, I'm no doctor, but I feel fairly certain that this image is called a CT scan. Um, so on your screen, you'll see a CT That's scan. That's correct. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, so this is, a, this is a CT scan. All right, so let's talk about what is going on because when you laugh, your brains release a bunch of hormones. So we actually brought in two renowned experts to show you a video. Connor, this video, these people are extremely sought after uh, I can't even believe you know, experts in the field, right? We were able to book them. I thought I thought we were going to go with someone easier to get. I thought we got Barbara Streisand for this section. <laughs> yeah. so we don't have abs? Yeah, if yeah. Bar well, Barbara, Barbara was begging us, begging us. But instead, the Barbara um, we said, no, no, we, yeah, we really wanted these two. So we're going to show a quick video from a couple of experts on what happens in our brains when we laugh. <laughs> if and the video does in fact cue the video show the show the and ct scan scan again let's talk cocktails brain cocktails that is when we laugh our brains release a cocktail of hormones these hormones make us feel happier less stressed slightly euphoric and more trusting. If only I could give oxytocin to my cat. He won't come near me. This means that when we laugh with colleagues, we're not just having fun. We're serving up a powerful hormone cocktail that can literally change their and our brain chemistry on the spot. I love cocktails. Cheers to that. Cheers to you, generic business person. And to you, our dear learners. Wait, how does laughing do all that? Research shows that laughing has unparalleled effects on our cut neural chemistry and Naomi. behaviors. It changes the chemistry Naomi, of cut your the brain tape. to make you more prime. What happened? There's no, there's no, oh, there we go. It's, uh, you were frozen. You looked like you were in pain and we just heard the audio. Oh, well, all right. All right. Can you hear Can you see us now? Yep, you're back. Okay, great. Well, that video is really awesome. We'll send it all to you later. Uh, instead, I'm going to give you a quick summary. <laughs> so here's what happens when we laugh. We think of humor as something that is fun, frivolous, and connects us emotionally and psychologically. And in fact, it is changing our biology. So when we laugh, our brains release this cocktail of healthy hormones. And as you saw in the video, these include things like dopamine, right? So we get a pleasure hit. We release endorphins, something similar to a runner's high, right? We lower our cortisol. This makes us feel less stressed and calmer. This is why humor in particular is linked to creativity. And we also release oxytocin, which is often called the trust or love hormone, often uh, also released during certain types of physical touch. And so in essence, as far as our brains are concerned, laughing is like exercising, meditating, and having sex at the same time. And it is logistically wow. really much simpler. She All said of those sex. benefits. What was that, Connor? She said sex. Everyone's listening now. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. All right, so let's give this a try again. Can people see my screen and am I not frozen in a horrible fashion? Yes, thank God. Yes, we can see it now. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and and I, I think what, one thing that's important about this is that the these changes in our brain uh, don't just impact how we see ourselves, but they impact how we behave and how others 
see us and how they behave. So in one of our favorite studies, researchers asked subjects to negotiate with this fake art dealer. And they were supposed to negotiate over the price of a piece of art. And there were two groups. In one group, the art dealer um, uh, gave, uh, ended the negotiation with a final offer. So they said something like, my final offer is you know, $200. So that was, that was group condition one. In condition two, they ended with the same offer. So my offer is $100 but they added a lighthearted comment. I'll, I'll offer, my final offer is hundred dollars, but I'll throw in my pet frog and, and I'll throw in my pet frog. So just like this small addition of levity, if someone in the work environment did this to you, would it change your behavior? What this study found is that it did. There was a statistically significant difference in the frog condition where people were willing to pay 18% more for that piece of art. And what's more, they later reported enjoying the task more and feeling less tension in the negotiation. What we see is that this humor, it changes our behaviors, it changes our persuasiveness, and it helps strengthen and forge deeper relationships with people. So before we go any further, we know that um, you know everyone is dispersed around the world and everyone here got to go to Harvard, but didn't get to go where we teach, which is Stanford. So normally we teach over in California and we wanted to give mm. a little California vibe for you. So before we talk about closeness and building bonds, let's just show a quick clip just to sort of give the vibe. Like anthropological exploration. Next on the Californians. Oh, you're frozen again, Naomi. <laughs> Glad you came over, Java. Yeah, I'm glad too. Naomi. Maybe you should get going before Stewart gets home. Probably right. I was thinking I'd take Can You Drive over to San Vicente and then make a I, I'm fine sacrificing my dignity for if you can still watch the clip. Can you watch the clip? <laughs> no, it's the screen is frozen and you are frozen. Um, oh. Connor, can you present? Yeah, I'm trying to do it right now. Um, okay, great. I'm just trying to click through the, <laughs> the screen panic. is frozen and I'm frozen. <laughs> All right, I thought it was just me. Listen, I'm fine. I'm fine with that. Uh, while uh, Connor's host disabled screen sharing, can anyone give me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one second. Uh, Connor, you should be co-host. Arno. All right, great. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right, everyone buckle Come up. The Californians. I'm glad you came over, Java. Yeah, I'm glad too. Maybe you should get going before Stuart gets home. Probably right. I was thinking I'd take Can You Drive over to San Vicente and then make a left and get on the 405 North from there, and then I could just get off of Mulholland. I totally like that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, honey. I brought us some tangerines. This guy was selling them on the off ramp for everybody the two. Devin? Uh, what are you doing here? Sure. Why are you home so early? I skipped Wilshire and took Beverly over to Santa Monica and then took that all the way up. Oh, hey, Esther. Yeah, I just came over to fix the outside speakers on your patio. I think it sounds pretty sweet. How was work? Yeah, I think you should get home now, Devin. There's nothing going on, Stuart. I said go home. Get back on San Vicente, take it to the 10, then switch to the 4, 4 and 5, north, and then it's up to Milan, where you belong. Stuart! <laughs> At this time of day, it's gonna be jammed. Are you crazy? Just get on the 10 and get out of here. All right, we did a successful screen share. Was that our first this whole time that, that I think our, I was being successful? That was our first. Every other one was frozen. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
So uh, uh, I think Connor, you're supposed to still be sharing by the way. Sorry, yeah, let me. Uh, uh, all right, so I'll debrief that one, which is, it seems like a random clip, right? From the Californians, why are we showing that clip? Before the clip, Connor mentioned, and I had said as well that shared laughter makes us feel closer. So it turns out that strangers who laugh together before a conversation connect in ways that are different. So I want you to imagine that you are going into a job interview or a conversation with a new employee or just some new conversation with someone brand new over Zoom, right? How would your conversation be different right now versus it would have been three minutes ago? So we know from research that when people laugh together before having conversations with strangers, they end up connecting in ways that feel 30% more intimate and authentic. And so in essence, humor quickens the path to friendship. And this was a study where they literally had strangers walk in a room together. Half of those strangers watched a clip just like the one you, uh, you just saw. And then the other half uh, didn't. And those conversations in the humor condition were 30% more intimate and authentic. And we also know particularly valuable if you are in a relationship, whether it's a romantic relationship, whether it's a relationship with a close colleague, maybe a co-founder, uh, we know that when 40% more, Sally, Sally, you know this research well? Sally, come off mute if you know it. Join us, Sally. I, I don't know it, but I just had to say it because I'm humorous too. You said 30%. I mean, what's 30%? How do you get 30%? So I put 40%. <laughs> you will be 150% more authentic. Exactly. Um, so exactly. this is actually done. Uh, it's, it's a great question. It's a great push. So it was a combination of self-report. So how authentic did you feel in that conversation? And then they also had an external panelist of, um, of people who watched those conversations from behind glass, which is super creepy and how we like to do it in behavioral science. And it's the only way. And, uh, and those individuals rated how, uh, how intimate the conversation felt. Um, all right, so I mentioned that this is particularly powerful for couples. We know that when couples are asked to tell stories about moments of shared laughter versus stories about moments that were just positive in their relationships, those couples in the, in the shared laughter condition later report being 23% more satisfied in their relationships just because they have told stories about shared laughter. And of course, in a moment when we've never been more physically disconnected from others, when we rarely see our coworkers in person, um, or from the waist down, we don't even know if we're all wearing pants, that this ability to feel connected is, uh, is particularly important. All right, so there's a ton of other research that we should, that we could share. Um, we won't hear because you can all read the book or take our course, but for now we wanna shift our focus from the why to the how. How do we start climbing back up the humor cliff? Great. And uh, just to emphasize again, we, we would love to engage this group in dialogue. So if you have any questions or comments, just please throw them into the, the chat and we can we can discuss them live as they come up. Uh, so, so a little context here. Um, we When we do sessions, there's sometimes a focus on the more tactical and then there's sometimes a focus on the leadership techniques, right? So how do you set the tone from the top? How do you um, empower your employees to, uh, to, to bring their own sense of humor organically. How do you create cultures of levity, not just have humor yourself? Um, in the pre-submitted questions, there was a lot about tactical. How do we specifically bring more humor ourselves as individuals? And so we've catered the next 15 or so minutes to be uh, really focused on that tactical. Um, if people have other interests, you want to talk about um, whether it's humor and leadership or setting the tone from the top um, or other aspects of this, we're happy to handle that in Q&A and we're also happy to take it offline um, later as well. Uh, so with that, let's go into the comedy basics to give people some really, uh, really simple techniques from the world of comedy. Awesome. Thanks, Naomi. So before we uh, dive in here, just want to mention that Naomi and I have both studied improv. Uh, Naomi performed and studied improv for in LA for six years. Mm -hmm. And through the process of our class, we have interviewed hundreds of comedians about their work. And one thing we wanna stress is that comedy is an art, but it's also formulaic. And it's kind of like a sport where there are certain rules to the game. And if you master the rules, you can master that sport. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna teach you some of these 
key moves, some of these key elements of the sport of comedy, so that weaving uh, comedy and humor into your communications, into your everyday lives with, with your coworkers feels more natural and seamless. So with that, uh, we wanna start with some key uh, comedy principles. So the first, at the heart of comedy is truth. When we laugh at something, we're typically laughing because we think, oh, I do that, or I've seen people do that. And this is a really key kernel in that some of the best comedians, if you watch them, they are telling truths that what resonate with us for some reason. Mm -hmm. Another core principle of comedy is that surprise and misdirection are key to getting laughs. Misdirection occurs when you think someone will zig and instead they ostrich. Oh! Right, so, um, oh, you see what I did there? Come on. <laughs> so let's imagine you're at a dinner party, okay? And let's think about surprise and misdirection and, and why oh, this kind of- Remember dinner parties? Brains. Oh my gosh, I used to have the most wonderful time at my oh, dinner Oh, let's parties. go back to a simpler time. We like to just, oh, let's all remember dinner parties. We were within oh, six feet. Play the clip of Reagan again. Show me Reagan. <laughs> nothing calms beverages. me, nothing calms me like a video of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> um, so let's, let's imagine you're at the dinner party um, and you know, you see this, someone says, sorry, I'm late. I didn't want to come. Okay, so you're at a dinner party, someone comes in, sorry, I'm late, I didn't want to come. Um, so the truth is obvious, right? We've all felt this way, where we didn't want to come to a dinner party or a commitment and we showed up late. Now, where is the misdirection? Where is the misdirection? Throw it in the chat box. In this humor, Where is the misdirection? Why is this using misdirection and truth? Naomi, do you have the um, crickets soundtrack? Oh yeah. Okay, just play that. Uh, so where's the misdirection? All right, Ju Julian, Julian, you have been wonderfully engaged. And so I'd like to call on you and say, the truth is obvious. Where's the misdirection in this? Sorry, I'm late. I didn't want to come. Where's the surprise? Yeah, it's uh, it's honesty, right? That nobody would expect in this moment. So um, instead of coming out with a, um, I would excuse. Um, it's 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 mm -hmm. the, the the truth itself is a misdirection where people are like, oh, not expecting that to come. Exactly. Excellent. Beautiful. That's exactly right. Yeah. So what do we expect? You know, when someone says, sorry, I, sorry, I'm late. The normal excuses are, sorry, I'm late. Traffic was horrible. The link didn't work. We're a full year into the global pandemic and time doesn't make sense anymore. And I can't be expected to play by the rules, right? These are all what you would expect someone to say, but instead uh, they say, sorry, I'm late. I didn't want to come. Um, and so what this means is two things. The first is that comedy isn't about making things up. It's about being observant. It's about finding truth. And this is a really common misperception that we, that we hear with the executives that they think they have to kind of be like constantly storytelling and making stuff up. If you follow the best comedians of the world, they are uh, anthropologists of their own and sociologists of their own lives. They walk around and they journal everything that they experience, everything that they see. And from that truth, they mine humor. The second thing, structure matters. And what we see so often is that even a funny idea uh, often isn't enough. It needs to be encased in a way and structured in a way that allows you to misdirect the listener. All right, so what are some simple ways that we can start doing this? How do we mine our lives for truth and then build in that misdirection. So we're gonna go through a quick exercise and this is interactive. So we want you to grab a pen and a piece of paper, be ready to jot down some notes and be ready to share with the group. This is going to be from your own life. So finding your funny, how do we start with truth? All right, a lot of times when you simply say the thing that people are thinking, it'll get laughter of recognition. This isn't about being clever, it's just about being truthful. So as we go through, think, think about some observations that you've made about yourself 
or about other people that you can share with us. So as one example, Sarah, the comedian Sarah Cooper noticed that her Mondays were always really busy and she made this observation, Friday, I'm just gonna move all these things to Monday and then Monday, oh my God, what have I done, right? She always falls into this, into this same uh, trap. She also noticed that she was always cold in the office. So she made this chart of what she wears during fall, winter, spring, and summer. And then most finally, this was a tweet uh, that we saw the other day that just thought was so great. I'll give you a second oh, to awesome. read through this tweet and why it is just so true. A simple observation that things are feeling really mundane and really repetitive in our world right now. Right, so these are not, um, these are really just simple observations from people's lives. So now a question for you, what is one observation that you've recently made about yourself or others? And remember, we are not going for humor here. We are just trying to observe what's true in our lives and in the world around us. So jot down as many observations actually as you can think of. And when you, and once you have a couple start dropping them into the chat box. Yeah, don't be shy and don't be funny just about truth right now. Yep. John, beautiful. I'm not reading as much mm. fiction as I used to. Great, great observation. Michelle, no one in my workplace wants to show their face on Zoom or Teams or Google Hangouts. They really don't like each other. <laughs> Michelle, great, love it. Okay, people see my garage door opener every day on Zoom. Great. All right, Julian, let's take a look. Where is Julian's garage door opener? Ah, <laughs> ah there, there it is. is. Beautiful. Um, okay, Anton, observe that folks are so predictable in terms of behavior. Anton, come off mute and tell us an example of, uh, of a predictability that you've noticed. You've got this, Anton. Sorry, guys, I'm having troubles here. Um, no problem. I don't know. I think just in general, I can just make a general statement that behavior is so is so predictable. When when you're asking your children, I have two of them, to, to do something, um, these days it's it's what, what's in it for me, and so it's mm. it's mm -hmm. an intergenerational gap that I'm just trying to identify in, in terms of kids. Thank you. I love that. That's great. People are so predictable. So let's build on that for a second. What else is predictable? I uh, Here's one I've noticed. Whenever you're on a call and it gets closer to the next steps, sometimes people will get more and more vague and they'll zoom out more because no one wants to actually take accountability for the next steps. What else is predictable? Amy, I don't think you meant this as a response, but people can't help but check themselves out in windows slash reflective surfaces. So predictable. People love hearing themselves talk. I'm having the best time of my life right now. That's exactly right, Jeremiah. Um, great. Kathy, my new collaborator at work and I share a few unexpected things in common. We play poker and shoot pool. Neither has anything whatsoever to do with our work. Great, love that. Recently mm. noticed how people like to signal their status on Zoom. Lynn, how do people signal their status on Zoom? Uh, let me count the ways. Uh, I, know it's, I really love the bugs with the uh, university <laughs> uh, name on it. And then the, the way they hold it in such a way that it's, it's hard not to read it. How do uh, I hold my mug also, in a higher status way? Is this, am I doing it? Is this high status? I'm doing it. If it had a Harvard emblem on it, this is what it would do. Love yeah, it, that's a, great. Okay, fantastic. So these small so observations. Good. Are, are truly where we find humor and especially for leaders, humor that feels more authentic. Um, all right, so, and I'll give one example here. So I work with a, we do a, a bunch of executive coaching as well. And one of my clients is a former professional athlete. He's the CEO of a um, large company and, uh, and he's also the father of four kids. And so Connor mentioned that this is the most common misperception among people that executives think, okay, they come to us and they say, I have to give a talk. What funny line should we put in? 
And we say, okay, great. Forget that. Forget the talk. Just tell me what's true about your life. What do you love more than other people? What do you dislike? What bothers you more than other people? What's your relationship like with your partner, your colleagues, your kids? What areas of incongruity exist in your life? How would your kids describe you versus your colleagues describe you? And these areas are really where we find humor. And so for this particular um, executive, he said, well, you know, we had this conversation. What's true about what's true for you? He said, well, my kids don't listen to me. Okay, great. My kids don't listen to me, which is similar to um, Anton, your observation that, you know, kids these days just are, are, you know, what's in it for me, right? Really simple observation. My kids don't listen to me. And so we talked about what are your goals with humor? And he said, well, people feel very disconnected from me. They feel, I feel like the status barrier between me and my team is a, a barrier to us getting stuff done. He said, great, okay, so how do we humanize you with this humor? And so he ended up opening a talk that he was giving and he said, listen, um, and he acknowledged it, right? I wanna acknowledge the status barrier in the room. When I walk into this room, I'm the CEO. When I walk into the booth, I'm a 14 time MVP, you know, a professional athlete. But I want you to know that when I walk in my home, you know, the front door of my home, I am the executive assistant to an 11 year old and a 13 year old daughter. And I take that job very seriously. And he went on to describe basically how his 11 and 13 year old completely own his life and how they don't listen to him. And, and they're like the worst bosses ever. And in doing that, he hit on some of the tropes that other people say about him, right? Mm -hmm. Like his kids don't listen. They've got too big of heads. You know, they've had, they've had success in their little league uh, tournaments. And so it's let it, you know, it's gone to their heads. And so these windows into what's genuinely true for our lives, that is how we are going to use humor in the workplace that mm -hmm. makes us more accessible, makes us more human and also feels uh, really authentic. All right, so with that, we have these couple of observations. Now, what do we do? We can exaggerate. So let me share my screen again. And these observations are just killer. Um, can you all see my screen? Yep. All right, great. So once we have this kernel of truth, we, we then have some tools that, all, that we can apply to then mine these truths for humor. And one of the most common ones that we talk about in our class is exaggeration. So just to review some examples of exaggerating the truth, here's a, here's a tweet that we like. Finally gets the car seat installed correctly. Where's the baby wife in college, right? So the, it starts with the truth. What is the truth? Installing a baby seat is really hard. What did he, this person do? They exaggerated it, take it to an extreme. Let's look at another one, another visual uh, exaggeration. What is the truth here? What is the truth? The truth is that there are increasingly uncomfortable seats in a in a plane right how do you exaggerate this you have the economy section economy discomfort section the economy uh, agony section the economy to the reckoning where is your god now economy satan's den economy and then just poop in the last row uh, so again starting with a simple truth about airline seats mining it for humor so now let's go back to some of your submissions um, let's go back to the things you wrote in the chat how would you exaggerate the truth of the uh, observation that you made? How would you make it bigger, more explosive, right? So if we have, um, you know, any one of these, Michelle, I get my five, my daily five steps in, uh, in some days inside my small two, so, two story house. How could you make that even bigger? You know, how could you imagine running a marathon in your house or, or, or doing, you know, all these other crazy activities in that confined space? Julian, with your garage, like what else do people see that they should not see going on in your in your house or in your garage? So everybody take a couple minutes, um, actually so just take one minute and do your best to exaggerate your truth. Just try to make it 10X bigger. And then if you're comfortable, share it in the chat. I haven't read a single word <laughs> yes. since the pandemic began. <laughs> nice, John, great. Very good. Yeah, super simple, right? I haven't read a single word since the pandemic began. I've just been so caught up in screens. I love that. That's awesome. Any others? Any other brave souls? <laughs> when Esther is a fancy home, I say it's nice. <laughs> love it. Great, Anton. 
So good and done. All right, well, here we go. My garage door is the emergency exit to the free world where pen when pandemic is over and I gained 100 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's so good. Oh my gosh. They'll walk their cats and their parrots too. Perfect. So this is, we are experiencing, this is the process of mining our lives for humor. And if you do this long enough, if you continue to make observations and try to riff, of them, riff on them with exaggeration, this is where humor comes from. This is the, the foundation of stand-up routines and some of the best comics work. All right, so next, uh, next technique that we wanna go through quickly is compare and contrast. And uh, quite simply, you either look for areas of contrast in your life, which is of course what my client did. He noticed that uh, my kids don't listen to me at home. And yet when I'm at work, everyone listens to me and we can go to the next slide, Connor. Oh, maybe Connor's frozen. <laughs> Connor, you're frozen. You can unshare. Hmm. Am I frozen? Can someone come off mute and tell yeah, me if you no, can uh, Connor, me? No, Connor is frozen. Uh, I'm okay, trying great. to stop sharing his screen. Let me see. Okay, great. All right, so, um, so let's do this. I'm going to give you a couple really quick voiceover techniques, and then I'd love to go to some of the great questions in the chat as well. So next technique is compare and contrast. This is where you genuinely look for areas of contrast in your life. For executives, this is these contrasts abound, right? This is what my client did. He said, "I'm, I, you know, I'm regarded this way in one setting, and I'm regarded in a completely different uh, way in another setting." Um, there was Natalie, a. You're, you're there good was now a great... to share if you want to. You're okay, good to great. share if you want. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, sure. Yeah, let's share for another minute. But then I think I'd love to go to some of the fantastic questions that are coming up um, in the chat. So let's sure. do a quick minute more here. Okay. All right, there we go. Can you all see this? Yeah. Great, the bunny on fire. All right, so compare and contrast, right? So Sarah Cooper, uh, you can tell that we love Sarah Cooper. She was an early guest in our class um, and she's fantastic. Uh, she noticed that there are two types of travelers. Her husband, I brought an extra European adapter if you need one. And her, oh my God, I forgot to pack underwear again, right? You all know who you are. Which of these two? Uh, next we had this, which I think resonates with all of our experience of the world right now, right? I hope this email finds you well. How the email found me. Anyone? Yeah, pretty, uh, pretty much. Uh, so a couple different things here. This first technique is looking at you versus other people in your life, right? So is there contrast between you and others in your life? This is how we all act in business versus what's going on for us, right? There's incredible contrast between how we are presenting ourselves versus what feels like the world burning or freezing in many ways, right? And then the third is how we were before versus how we are now, right? So, so temporal change. Me at 16, I want to see my face on TV. I want to be a legend. Me now, I want to be a gnome with a tiny shop in the woods where I cobble shoes. I'll ride a goose to work and sip rain from an acorn. And my only worry is, will there be enough pies for the name day feast? Right? How we, how we were before, how we'll be versus how we are now. Of contrast. What areas of contrast is, exist in your life? What areas of contrast do you notice in the world around you? Um, I'm going to fly through this, uh, this next technique here. Uh, so this is really a, um, it's a hack. Because we talked about how humor is truth and misdirection. A really easy hack for, um, for humor is to use what's called the rule of three, where you make a very simple list and the unusual thing is that third element, right? This is what my client did. He said at home, or he said at work, I'm this way, in the announcing booth, I'm this way, and at home, third element. Uh, Amy Schumer opens her Netflix special with, this is such a big deal for me. I don't know if you guys know this, but this past year I've gotten very rich, famous, and humble, right? Unexpected third element. Uh, Connor and I, for the course that we teach um, called Remotely Humorous, we have a page with testimonials from people who have taken it uh, previously. And then we also have testimonials that have been where we've been featured 
um, in different articles. So we have, for example, recent press, Fast Company said a highly entertaining series of videos, yeah, yeah. Business Insider said engaging content and learning tools. And then Connor's mom said this, right? So one, two, and three. If we started these testimonials with Connor's mom versus Fast Company, it would be totally weird. And yet, because we know people read left or right, and we know that this is a trope that people do on their business website, they always put where they've been featured in the press, having this ridiculous testimonial from Connor's mom, which is actually her just using the phone wrong, is unexpected. And of course, there we find humor. So I want to end this um, portion of really quick hacks with a couple of things that you can be doing right now. And in particular, um, we wanted to address um, Michelle, or I don't know if it's Michelle or Michele, apologies, Michelle or Michele, who said, um, what about humor over email? Um, that, you know, how do we think about infusing humor in that way? Because of course, a lot of our communications are electronic. So a couple of daily hacks, how to write like a human. Number one, just talk like a human. So our students, we do a, an exercise where they have to read the last 10 emails in their sent folder, and they have to submit what was the most egregious humanless jargon that you said in those emails. Winners receive a prize. But the idea here is when we start communicating through electronics, we start acting less human. And so read your emails aloud, just write like a human. Number two, serendipitous sign-offs. Never sign off with best regards, kind regards. Try and use something a little bit lighthearted um, in that. And in particular, use what's called a callback, which we'll talk about later. So as one example, um, I was on a call. It was a 3 p.m. call with a client. And that client kept talking about how many coffees she'd had that day. And I said, yeah, you know, I've had my second cup of coffee too. So I signed off that email with yours, heavily caffeinated. Uh, I was on a call the other day with my co-author and her dog ran into the office and Jennifer yelled, Andy, her husband, who let the dog out? Which turned into a hilarious rendition of who let the dogs out. Uh, so signed off that email with still wondering who let the dogs out, Naomi. And then of course, one of my favorites that I've seen from someone else recently was, hope you're staying positive and testing negative, right? It's a really easy way to add a little bit of lightheartedness and an invitation to be um, a bit lighter. Next is a callback. So a callback is where you very simply make reference to a moment of humor that happened earlier. So what I do on a new call uh, with a client or with someone who I'm sort of getting to know is I'll just jot down any moments where the two of us shared laughter. Now, this doesn't need to be created, consciously created. We are humans and laughter is a fundamental melody of human conversation. There will be a moment of laughter. Just jot down what that context was and bring it back into the email. So for example, we were asking someone to guest lecture in our course at Stanford. And he mentioned on this call that he is very superstitious. And so you'll notice in the email I wrote, we're optimistically penciling you in while crossing our fingers, stroking rabbit foot keychains and throwing a thousand pennies into wishing wells that you can join. Now, uh, right, just making a callback and referencing something that he thought was funny. All right, and last we have show what you meme. So visual humor can be incredibly powerful, especially in this time. And we know this from Twitter. We know this from Instagram. We know this from our lives, right? I'm back. But it can be really powerful in business as well. So I want to share a personal experience, which was um, I had done a speaking engagement for a client. And it was actually a former colleague of mine. And they owed me a lot of money. Then they ghosted me. I sent in my invoice, didn't hear back, all right? I, okay, I'll, I will say that this part is my fault. She said, hey, the first file is not a PDF and I can't access it. Okay, no problem. So I said, here you go, Jen, attached are the updated invoices and PDF version, August 2nd. Couple of weeks later, hey, Jen, any updates on this or anything else you need from me? No response. A few weeks later, checking in on this again, Jen, is there anything I can do to help push this forward? Crickets. These people owe me tens of thousands of dollars, and this is really inappropriate, right? Okay, so what do I do? I decide a month later that we need to take a different tactic. Now, I know from a previous conversation with Jen that she's obsessed with cats. She has a couple cats herself. And so I send this in an email with absolutely no context. Hello from the other side, I must have meowed a thousand times. A cat meme about Adele, right? 
Within the day, she writes back the next day, I'm working on it. I have the most, least responsive OGC person. I sent another note today. And within the week, I was paid. So this is clearly uh, a lame cat meme. And yet where multiple heartfelt entreaties had failed, a cute, really desperate cat with Adele lyrics saved the day. And, you know, the lesson here is obvious that sometimes we have to get stuff done, right? And we can feel the more serious things get, the more dire things get, it can feel like we want to hold them tighter and tighter. And yet we know from human behavior that humor unlocks people, it makes people relax, it makes people more likely to want to work with you and think that you are a fun, great person. It's true. And so think about these moments as opportunities to give gifts, right? We've all been in that situation where someone's asking some of us and it feels uh, something of us and it feels like work, um, instead give them a gift of humor and they'll feel much less like work. Um, okay, I know that there are a couple of questions in the chat. I picked out a couple of them. So Joe, I'm happy to hit on them quickly here or if you have any particular questions that you wanna talk about, I'm happy to do that too. Yeah, thanks Naomi and, uh, and Connor for, for joining again. So yeah, that was really awesome. Just uh, two questions. There was one, you know, most of the, the participants here are entrepreneurs. Uh, is there a room for humor with uh, venture capitalists and in an email to a VC? Absolutely. So we, so Jeff Jordan from Andreessen is a guest in the class. We've done a, a bunch of work with um, Andreessen and Anthos and different, uh, different VCs in the Valley. And pretty universally, um, what we know, or not pretty universally, universally what we know is that humor is a sign of intelligence that people per perceive those who use humor as being more intelligent, more mentally agile. Um, it signals a sense of intellectual perspective, which of course founders need to have. It signals resilience. And so um, absolutely there is, there is a place for using humor um, in those contexts. Yeah. One thing we didn't talk about today, which is important to recognize, um, especially for people using humor strategically is there are different styles of humor. And we go over these in the book. You can go to humorseriously.com and take a quiz where you can learn what your humor style is. But those styles uh, briefly are the stand-up, the magnet, the sniper, and the sweetheart. And we know that different styles are gonna work well in different contexts. So I'll give you a personal example. I am a natural magnet, which means that my style is a little bit goofier, a little bit more upbeat. Um, when I was more junior in my career, I was in my mid twenties facilitating workshops for people who were mostly 20 years, my senior. And in that context, as a young woman, as usually the only woman in the room at the front of the room, I leaned very heavily into sniper and stand up style humor, which is the style that's a little bit more biting, a little more sharp, a little edgier, um, not afraid to ruffle feathers to get a laugh. So that when you're in that context will work very well. When I'm teaching at Stanford, when I'm now the highest status person in the room, right, among my students, I'm all sweetheart and magnet style humor, which is the style that's more uplifting, leans more on self-deprecation, because that's going to accomplish my goals in the room, which are not to gain me status. I already have what I need there. It's actually to make other people feel safe, to create, um, to create psychological safety, to create, have them feel more comfortable bringing out their senses of humor. So my short answer is absolutely you should be using it. And we need to get smarter about uh, what styles of humor we use based on what outcomes we want. Yeah, awesome. I think one, one, one additional thing to add there is just that, and, and I'm not sure if Naomi uh, addressed this when I was in the black abyss, but just remembering that the bar is so low for humor and it's often, it can be lower in certain industries compared to others. So if you look at VC, there's, I mean, there's often not a lot of humor going on in those pitch rooms. And so you have the opportunity to, to stand out. Um, now, now, granted, I think adjusting it so it's coming from the, the right place and aligned with your unique style is really important. But just remember that even the smallest gesture, the smallest um, bid to, to another person can really make a difference and help you stand out. Great. Um, in the last two minutes we have, would love to hear uh, the story directly from Connor about the time you were on a, on a team call and uh, you were handing off to your co-CEO and you were sharing your screen and you went to, to Google to type in, uh, you know, how to tell to, <laughs> to your, to your oh, employees. Yeah, would love to hear yeah, yeah. from you directly that story. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and, and this is just an anecdote, again, um, just about the small ways that you can make really powerful gestures of humor and levity to your team, especially if you're in a, um, in a, um, a position of power, a position of, uh, with positional authority. It, this was the, the first all hand that, that I had with my team uh, since we had gone to Zoom and spirits were low, people were stressed um, and I really wasn't sure what to say. And um, so after I gave some of my remarks about what was going on and what this meant for the company and our path forward, I then passed it off to another person on my team. I was sharing my screen, I was sharing a deck and I passed it over to the person on my team, uh, pretended to not realize that my screen was still on. And I then proceeded to Google search things inspirational CEOs say. And then I would periodically say those things throughout the, throughout the rest of the, the meeting. I think the takeaway from this is, um, especially if you are leading an organization, um, you know, uh, self-deprecation can be really powerful as a, as a humor channel um, and try to be creative and find new ways to play with your teammates and express humor in this new medium uh, of work that we're experiencing right now. Awesome. Uh, we're just right on time. Uh, Naomi and Connor, thank you so much for joining us. We shared the, your website and the two bit.ly links. Are those still active and available to, the, to our community? Um, those I believe were from, were, uh, I don't know, but here's what you can do. You okay. can, um, so a couple of things, Connor remotely humorous is, I should really know our website right now. If you Google remotely humorous, no, oh, there, there we is. go. I just sent it. Okay, yeah. perfect. So remotely humorous is the, um, is the course that we, it's a nine week course or sorry, a seven week course that people can take independently, um, about how to have more humor in remote teams. And then the other thing is um, for right now, if you purchase a copy of our book, Humor Seriously, then you can get a 25% off discount code for our three week humor boot camp, which is um, a, uh, it's essentially, it's text messages to your phone every day to help you put this content into practice. So you can just email me directly if you would like that. That's a terrible thing to say, actually. Email hello at humorseriously.com, please. <laughs> If you'd right. like that offer. Awesome. Um, thank you so and much. Thank you, thank you so much for joining. And um, Connor and I would be more than happy. We'd be delighted to connect with you um, at any time about this. You know, it's it's our belief that this is actually some of the most important work that we need to be doing right now um, to have more humanity and more hu uh, and more humor in our in our lives, not just to make us more successful, to make our teams more creative but also to create places where, where joy can come more easily. And so here are our emails. Please feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Can I also um, say a special invitation to everyone? I left a, a message in the chat box. Um, we have an alumni group at the Harvard Club of New York. It's uh, called Comedy Center special interest group and um, we meet regularly um, to for alumni members to share our uh, failures with each other <laughs> and uh, to uh, by using humor to cheer each other up and build resiliency and promote connection through uh, the role of hu humor so I'd love to extend the invitation I left the contact information in the in the uh, chat box here. And sorry, um, I'm a chronic uh, procrastinator, so I joined the meeting late. I'm so happy to be connected to this uh, community here. <laughs>